Hello, fellow District 6270 Rotarians. Thanks for your interest in learning more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and opening up this YouTube video. I am Brian Monroe, and I am part of our district's new Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. I am thankful to our district's executive committee for recently approving this very important task force. Our DEI task force was actually in the planning stages prior to the murder of George Floyd and the shooting of Jacob Blake. Our task force was created to be a resource for our clubs in order to help them embrace and implement Rotary's 2019 DEI statement that you'll find on our district's homepage. Our task force will provide resources to Rotarians and clubs to learn from, to grow with, and to become even better clubs by embracing all forms of diversity. An example of how diversity has improved Rotary should be familiar to all, or at least most of you. Yes, it was only 30 plus years ago before women were officially welcomed into Rotary. Our clubs in Rotary are much better for it. Because of that, one of Rotary's ongoing goals is to continue to increase the number of women in our clubs and to welcome and embrace contributions from all people. I'll say that again, to welcome and embrace contributions from all people. My home club is MT Sunrise and our DEI committee is devoting one meeting a month to what we've referred to as meaningful conversations. This video that you're about to watch is a recent example. We also bring in speakers who are knowledgeable in the subject and I encourage other clubs to try this. Thanks again for watching and please feel free to let me know what you think or to contact me with any questions. Peace. But the anticipation of the beloved community that wrong will be made right, <clears throat> that love will replace fear, and that wellsprings of justice water our faith always. So <clears throat> I thought that each one of those four told something about the caliber of the people that we're going to we're going to listen today. Uh, I want to remind us all of the, the guidelines for this conversation. <clears throat> Specifically, I want to to um, point out to the one that says, I know the reality of the panelist stories, because we have a lot of questions and some of those answers are get to be quite personal, perhaps. And so it may, even though it may be challenging to hear their story, I ask you to please listen and honor the reality of their stories, okay? And so with that, <clears throat> I will start with our first question. <clears throat> While many Americans might like to think that racism no longer exists in their communities or in their lives. Evidence suggests otherwise. Okay, for, for all three of you, could you tell me what is, the, what is it like to be a person of color in the suburbs, particularly Mequon, Cedarburg, Kingsville, Grafton, or Fort Washington? Please share any <clears throat> race-related experience you or your family have had in the community. And we'll start with Errol. Okay, um, I've been, uh, in this community for 34 years. Um, and so I've, I've had a, a number of um, situations that were both good and bad. Um, I think uh, the encounter with the police department uh, early on when we first moved here um, was, was pretty intense. Um, you know, as, as Lucia said, I was a I am a commercial banker, um, but there are a lot of times where I traveled out of the state and um, or had events to attend where I'd come home late at night. And um, they would pick me up on the corner of Port Washington and, and uh, Mequon Road and follow me all the way to my house. Um, it, it, it got to be so bad that my wife had to finally call the police department and, and tell them, you know, who I was, that we lived here and that they should stop following me. Um, but it continued. And one of my more interesting uh, encounters with them was uh, on my way to work one morning. And, you know, as you go down Port Washington Road, there's a little spur that takes you in past Condoline Road, then you get on the expressway. And I was probably the third car in a line of five cars. And so there's a motorcycle cop there and he 
somehow or another managed to get behind me and pull me over. And um, he wanted to, to know who I was. Um, I had a brand new car at that time. I was really proud of the fact that I was able to buy a brand new car. And, uh, you know, he asked me uh, whose car it was. Um, then he proceeded to ask me what make and model the car was. Um, and, and so um, he got back to his motorcycle and called me in. And uh, <clears throat> what I heard about this conversation later was from uh, one of the fathers uh, of the, the youth football players that I used to coach. Um, and he was monitoring police calls and he said that uh, he went to, to call me in. Um, they told him immediately that, that I was the, uh, on the police and fire commission and that if I didn't have done anything wrong, that he needs to give me back my driver's license and, and let me go on my way. And, and so that's what he did. Thank you. Um, anyone, Erica, or <clears throat> if you have any comments about this, this question, do you want to repeat the question or do you have it? Um, this is Erica. Uh, I, what I have found about um, the instances of racism in Ozaki County, I, like I said, I live in Cedarburg, but we spend time in Mequon and Port, is that it really is a, a, a covert kind of racism, because when you start to talk about it, people are looking for these big giant flashpoints that we've seen you know, during civil rights times, well, the, the civil rights in the 60s, because I do believe like we're going through civil rights now in 2020, um, another, another movement. Um, but it's hard to tell people about those things that are covert. They are kind of all the time. It's kind of every, every instance has something in it. So, um, I, for me, one of the things that, that resonates with me is at work. I, I am a, a nurse. I used to work on the floor. I work in the IT department now. But even when working on, on the floor as a nurse, to not have people respect my abilities, um, to think that I, that I must not know what I'm doing, that they need to get validation from another nurse, a white nurse, um, the fact that I could walk into a room, we all wore the same scrubs and the assumption was always that I was environmental services. Nobody ever assumed I was the doctor. Nobody ever assumed I was the nurse, but they always assumed that I was environmental services. So, you know, some of those little things that just there, uh, if you talk about the, the mosquito bites of the microaggressions, that they're just always there. And there's so many of them, you know, over the course of the day, we um, have had, interactions with uh, police in Cedarburg. To Errol's point, when we moved here, my husband got, um, he worked on Silver Spring, so he got followed home for the first two weeks that we lived here. And we're assuming that at some point, either they felt assured, since he was always coming back to the same place, that he must be okay. So then they stopped following him. They never stopped him. They just got behind him when he crossed county line and were just kind of follow him through or the not county line this the cedarburg city limits and would kind of just follow him through to make sure that he was okay i think probably some of the hardest most recent interactions that we've had um, have involved my son because there's already um, a mistrust generally in um, the black community for uh, law enforcement so that mistrust didn't come out of out of nowhere, you know, which is kind of built, it's built generationally. Um, so our experience has been trying to tell our, our children, I have two daughters and my youngest one is a son, he's 20 now, trying to teach him how to respect others, how everyone's dignity is wrapped up in, in each other, um, how to act. Unfortunately, I did a lot of teaching of how not to be the stereotype, even though he wasn't a stereotype, I, I knew how others would see him. So make sure that you don't do any of those things that people can use to put you in a box. 
but um, more recently he was walking. He likes to take pictures. He's an amateur photographer. So he has some of my grandfather's pic uh, cameras from the 60s. And he likes to go out and take those pictures. And then he has a big fancy digital camera. And Cedarburg has you know beautiful sites everywhere. People are always taking pictures of our area. So he decided to go out um, on a beautiful day and take some pictures because the leaves were pretty, everybody's grass was so nice. And he walked probably half a mile from where our house is, but he was still on the same street and, and he got stopped by the police. And it wasn't that he had, um, he didn't know what happened. He just saw the police car come rolling up beside him and, and the officer, get, he stopped, the officer gets out and, um, it was because three different neighbors called the police to say that there was a black guy walking down the street. So as I'm telling my son, this is how you treat other people, never assume things about people, get to know people, say what you mean, mean what you say, you know, all these great things, be careful, be aware, but how do I continue to teach my children this thing if the world isn't doing the same? So the police officer was, was he, he said, I had to come and check because three people called. He's like, what are you doing? Just walking around taking pictures? Yeah. Oh, okay. Police officer got in the car and left. So that, that, that incident wasn't one necessarily, oh my goodness, what, what happened with the police? The police officer, I believe, did the right thing. He had to come because people were calling, but that's still for he was 19 at the time it happened last year how do you then grow up to be an adult african-american man without additional biases when these are the things that happen to you when you're you're not doing anything so um i think those are those are some of the the ones that stand out for me um and and particularly with my son if i don't want him to fall into a bitterness or an ugliness or an anger against authority figures. I need the authority figures to treat him properly and respect him and allow him to be his fullest self, to be the person that he is meant to be and not growing up defensive because you know, you feel like the world is against you because that's what you see. You know, James Baldwin, right? I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. Those are the things that are done to him. And that's a part of his growing up. And that's that's not how it should be. Thank you, Erica. I wanted to say that I, I being the mother that I am as well, when my son was coming to visit, I preempted the, 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 the conceptions like giving the police a picture of my son and saying, this is the guy. <laughs> He's like this, you know, don't don't buy him while he's here. But, I agree. I understand what you're saying. Renee, how about yours? Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I can't say that I have had any um, negative experiences in the Mequon, Thamesville, Cedar Bird area. Um, I actually live just on the other side of County Line Road, so my residence is actually Milwaukee. But what I wanted to explain is that um, I have it, unusual circumstances in that I am a black female and I do not look typical. I was born in Washington, DC. I lived um, a number of years in California and subsequently Illinois prior to coming to Milwaukee. And I never had questions uh, in Washington, D.C. or in Los Angeles, because it seems that everybody understood that there is such a thing as Black people that fall on an entire spectrum of shades and that I am definitely on the lighter end of the spectrum, but there was never any question until I came to Milwaukee. The most common question I get is are you mixed? And I take issue with that question, mixed, because what does it mean to be mixed? Okay, to me, mixed means mama's white or daddy's white. One of them must be white for me to be this light. And both of my parents are black. They're both light 
but they're both black. And going back into their history to see, well, where did the light skin come from? Some of it started from slavery days when my ancestors had no choice. Um, and through the years, because some of my earlier descendants were fairly light, some of their partners were white historically. So I've got a pretty good amount of white blood in me, but I was definitely raised with a clear understanding of my blackness. So I think God must just have a sense of humor because along the way I have met black people who would look at me and say, wow, I, I wish I was white. <laughs> and if I look like you, I wouldn't tell anybody I was black. And it's one, it's one thing when a white person says that, but it, it hurts my soul to hear my black brothers and sisters have that perspective because I have a very clear understanding of my black roots and a very deep respect for my black roots. And I would never tell anybody that I was anything other than black. So consequently, it's put me in some unique experiences through the years. When I walk into a room, nobody assumes a black person walked in. So they say or do whatever they normally like to do. So I get to see the different sides of people that maybe they would hide from me if I looked more typical. And then the flip side is when I walk into black environments, yeah, you know, they kind of look and say, well, what's she doing here? <laughs> and so sometimes if there are other white people in the room and there's any level of mistreatment or disrespect, I'll call them just as quick, uh-uh, no, you don't act like that to somebody that's white. If you wanna sit up here and say, you don't wanna be discriminated against, what do you look like discriminating against somebody? So I, I kind of like flip, if you wanna say it like that, not with the intent of denying who or what I am, because I've never met anybody human that was so important that I should deny what my father in heaven did. So he has a sense of humor. That's fine with me. <laughs> so that's my little story. Thank you, Renee. I forgot to mention that we, we will definitely uh, open up for questions. If anybody wants to ask a question, go we'll straight to hand and, and we can continue that way. Um, Bob, you have the next question? Bob? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Just, had to, just had to unmute. Um, you know, we, we've listened to um, the kinds of experiences that not just you have had, but you know, I've done a lot of reading lately about the Great Migration and um, Jim Crow and just th these situations that those of us who haven't experienced them just find um, devastating. And I'm I'm wondering, um, you know, when you talked about um, you know, Ariel, you talked about some of the things that happen are good and bad. Some are intense. Some are subtle. Um, Erica talked about microaggressions and a, a mosquito, um, the situation when, when you walk into a room as an RN and people wonder if you're part of the housekeeping crew. Um, you know, R Renee talking about, well, in fact, she gave a very good example of how she handles a situation with disrespect. But I'm wondering, you know, for each of you, um, if you could talk about how you handle some of these situations. You know, I find myself around people who may say things um, that are certainly, uh, as Renee used the word, hurtful to the people who are hearing them. Um, and yet I don't know how to respond. And I'm wondering in your cases, um, you know, Errol and, 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 and Renee and Erica, um, how have you found that you can effectively respond and maybe even turn a bad experience into a teachable moment, if I can go that far? But um, how, you know, help us understand how 
not only you can respond to these, but how when these things happen, we can respond to them. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and speak up first and say that that is exactly what you should do too. If you see something that's not right, speak up. I'm kind of a wizard at speaking up. <laughs> but um, the interesting thing for me recently, I serve with the Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. And they designated racism as a national health crisis. And they wanted to have a specific uh, group in their organization that would handle um, the racism issue. And so since they looked around and I was like one of only two black folks in the club, I got voluntold to run it. I said, well, that wasn't what I wanted to do, but I get it, so I will run it. And one of the first meetings that we had, um, people identified, because you have to understand a lot of the doctors that do serve in this particular organization are concerned about climate and very much aware that the climate change issues have a far heavier impact in our minority communities than they do in our majority communities. Um, and so there are people that don't tend to be racist in the first place, but have they ever seen examples of racism? Yes, as we all have. And so my question is, well, why do you not speak up? And the answer was because within the health profession, to speak up about those issues is considered to be unprofessional. What? Unprofessional to speak up about something like that? Racism and all of its effects have just as much a deleterious effect on our human bodies as high blood pressure. Why would you be designated as unprofessional because you don't speak up. If that is a part of the culture of healthcare, that's the first thing we need to change. Because perhaps if people spoke up more and were called out on those situations, maybe it would slow down, stop, or maybe not be so obvious. I don't know. But that's one thing that I would like to see my health colleagues address and do something about so that they do feel comfortable speaking up. The other issue that they pointed out is that there have already been a number of articles published in our medical journals, oh my, that are decidedly racist in their approach to various health problems. We need to make sure that that practice that has been done historically stops because it ingrains racism in the ability to care for a person that needs to stop too. Thank you, Lucia. Um, Bill, or? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go next. Um, you know, I think that uh, Racism is a more generational thing, and uh, it's it's hard to convince anybody in a in a two minute conversation that you know their views are are wrong and hurtful, um, and and so I, I tend to to focus on on the youth in our community. Um, as I said, I I ran our youth football program in Mequon for 15 years. So every year I would see 300 kids, you know, and, and a lot of times, uh, you know, we had some kids that, that lived in Milwaukee were 220 kids and they, they rode the bus to school. Um, during our early part of practice in August, um, they had nowhere to stay because school didn't start. So we kept them at our house. Um, and, and, they would tell me about things that were said to them um, by, by other kids. 
And so when I when I hear those things, when I see those things, um, I, I immediately jump into action, and and I, I want to be able to understand how they got to that perspective. Um, you know, where did you where did you hear that? Where did you learn that that kind of thought process? Um, and 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 as I said, I'm not going to change anybody's perspective in a two minute conversation, particularly older individuals who, you know, have this pretty much ingrained in them. Um, but when it happens to our youth, um, it's very important that I, I step in and take some action um, and, and see if I can change that thought process early on so that, you know, as they go through life, you know, they're, they become a little bit more sensitive about other issues and, 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 and what other people have to go through. Mm -hmm. Oh, Carol, uh, Don's got a question. He's got his hand up. Oh. I was uh, waiting to hear from Erica and then you can, then I'll ask my question. <laughs> Erica? Okay. Yes. Um, I, I have so many different um, thoughts about this and it's a part of the, the tension and turmoil. If you think about, um, me as a black woman, obviously black people are not a monolith, so we're not speaking for everyone. Me as a black woman going through the same kind of um, repeated harm that my mom went through, my grandma went through, and it's really hard to get to this place in 2020, having the same kind of conversations and trying to convince somebody of your, your dignity and your humanity because they don't believe it so. Um, so part of the, the struggle I have with this is I try very hard to be patient and respectful with people. So um, I make it a point, if I'm offended, I tell you that I'm offended and why, because how can I hold you to a standard of not doing something if you don't know? So mm -hmm. I try to do that. One of the, the problems that I have is I'm pushing 50. So I've been doing this for 50 years, I am tired. It is, it's exhausting when you have one person who is very intentional and in trying to learn and trying to do better. But if I'm one of um, what, 1% African-Americans in Cedarburg, that's 5,000 people to one. I can't be that person for everyone. And that, and it's tiring trying to help and trying to show and trying to convince so many people over and over again. And that's one of the reasons why we started Bridge the Divide, because then we could provide a learning platform for multiple people. So if I have 200 people that are engaged and learning and growing, then of those 200 people, they could each go to their circle of influence and help with some education, some um correction if there's a, a behavior or a saying or that joke that that other people can then be responsible for responding and speaking up and that it doesn't always have to be the person who is you know the most victimized in that conversation or in that joke so um i think it's also the the layers that have to be addressed for racism. There is the, the hands and heart and mind, you know, let's, uh, if, when you know better, you do better, right? Um, so there's that aspect, but then there's also 400 years of policies and laws and, and um, governmental community actions that have been continued. So we have to break that cycle too. So again, Bridge the Divide, we want you to speak respectfully, we want you to educate yourself. So read some books, learn some things, have some small groups, talk through some of those. We want you to also come to the Common Council with us when we talk about, well, if there is racism here, how is the community responding to that? Do we have any, um, in our school board meetings, do we have curriculum that is perpetuating racism? Do we have a chance to teach more about the value of 
people of color throughout history. I mean, we're in Wisconsin. How much are we talking about indigenous folks? And, you know, when we talk about Cedarburger or Ozlaki County, do we start with, oh yeah, well, my ancestors came here from Germany. Well, you know that there were people here before that. So have we talked about those folks and what happened to them and, and how your ancestors came to be here? We, we need to have the conversations about history. We need to have the conversations about policy. Um, we're in communication with the police chief and with the sheriff of Ozaki County to say, let's look at some of your practices and are they um, based in bias? Are they, do they have an inherent uh, biases towards people of color with you not even being aware of them? And if we bring it up to you and you see that, well, then you have to change it. Let's change that policy. Let's talk about law. It's just, there's so many different levels. <laughs> so I think it's a big, it's really important to say, you, you find your sphere of influence. If wherever you are in your daily life, your work life, your personal life, wherever you are, that you've got to make some individual changes from there. And those conversations have to happen there. And, and I can't, I can't be the source of the conversation. And I think that's a, a burden that you feel as a, um, well, as me as a, an African-American woman. Thank you for what you're doing. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. So, um, and my question actually dovetails very well off of what Erica said, was talking. Um, Cause there, there's the saying that a fish does not know that it's in water and you know, I, I like to think that I can observe microaggressions in others. And so how do I help call out microaggressions in others without necessarily coming off as the great white protector? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open for suggestions. I, I, I very much enjoy, and I, I am a um, um, Christian and, and, really rooted in my faith. I, I have a, a deep connection to the, the thought of lament. And even when someone can't actively stand in front of me and fight off all of the microaggressions aggressions and, and stop all the racism coming at me, when I have somebody that I'm in relationship with, an, an intimate, meaningful relationship who is walking alongside me and has that lament, like a deep grieving when they see that I'm grieving and what hurt me and how it hurt me. I, I have, um, uh, that helps put people in my esteem, I guess, that you see that there is something happening. You're not ignoring it. You're not pretending that it didn't happen, but that you're grieving with me. I think that partnership helps people step forward together a little better because otherwise the things that I hear are, well, you must have misunderstood. That's not what they meant. I, I hear this all the time. I know exactly what they meant, you know? Um, so, so standing alongside me, I think the other big thing is the art of the apology. I have decided I'm gonna have to like create some kind of PowerPoint because we are, I think we are as, as Americans are not necessarily used to being wrong. We're used to asserting our, our, um, our knowledge, like we're always right. So when we're wrong, when we've said something wrong, when there's been a mistake or a misstep, I think we have to learn how to apologize and how to say not, I'm sorry you got offended, you know, but some kind of deep, meaningful, I, I see that that really hurt you. You know, yes, you can say that wasn't your intent, but, you know, also something to deal with the person that's, that's victimized by what happened. And I think that that, ap that apology, that we could get better at that, and that would solidify relationships more, maybe decrease some of the mistrust, maybe decrease some of the, um, the jump to anger, because again, it happens to me all the time. And here's just one more person saying one more thing to me, and it's the, my, you know, my last hour of work for the day, and I am just going to explode because I can't handle it anymore. You know, rather... Erica. Eric, Erica, uh, this is Dave Kleiber. I have a question for you uh, about what you said in your opening uh, statement. Uh, my uh, wife is also a nurse, nurse practitioner. And uh, of course, we talked quite a bit about uh, her career. And uh, 
I'm, I'm interested in when you were talking about being on the floor uh, it, and you had some, some comments about your race, were they patients that actually spoke out and said something about you? What, uh, or was it just a perception that you had about their attitude toward you? Typically it was the family. Typically it was the family of the patient. Um, you know, and I, and I have had family members ask me not to be their nurse. That didn't happen in Wisconsin. That was in Michigan. Um, but yeah, typically it's the family. And I think, you know, the, the patient, patient's awfully vulnerable. If this is the person that's coming in with my meds and caring for me, you know, they might think things. They may not say things because, well, gee, I can't make her mad if she's coming in with the, the syringe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I just wanted to make a comment okay. that I know it is uh, a difficult thing to figure out how to apologize, especially because you might feel like, oh, I'm being identified as the racist. Well, you have to understand that the person you're apologizing to has dealt with every minute of their life being black and being identified as somebody that you can say those kind of things too. And like Erica identified, she's tired. Many of us are tired because we do carry the burden of being the face of everybody that's black and receiving the brunt of every perspective about black people. And maybe your one little comment or, you know, joke or, you know, flip statement really was not representative of all white people and all racist comments that this person has absorbed their entire life. It's just one little comment. But you have to understand that that might be the straw that broke the camel's back. So be conscious of that and don't take it all like you know you are you know the end all but value that person and say something that lets them know that you do i i wanted to ask you all uh, we have i'm going to be aware of the time and it's almost time to end the meeting um, if people want to stay a little bit longer, um, and if the panel members can stay a little bit longer, but I, oh, actually we have a board meeting, right? Don't we, uh, Errol? Yeah, I uh, I do have a meeting that I have to get to. Um, yeah. This morning, so um, you know we're we're about two minutes away from the end of the the oh. hour, and uh, I just want to to uh, commend a little. Lucia on her efforts to to keep this meaningful conversations going. Uh, I think this has been very uh, informative, um, and I think it's something we need to do more of. And uh, I appreciate Erica and Dr. Renee for um, being a part of this panel today. I think this uh, was a good outcome. Hopefully, um, brought some light to to some questions that anybody might have. Um, and, and, and hopefully we'll continue to do this going forward. Errol, I just but, want uh, to encourage you. Errol, could I say yeah. one thing? Um, most of us have sat here quietly listening, absorbing. Um, and I think the one thing that we can all do is put ourselves in the place of others. And that, that goes across the board, uh, but especially when it comes to racism. Your stories this morning are in some, it, they're heartbreaking to me. Absolutely heartbreaking to think that, that you leave your, the comfort of your home and that police officers could be following you, not because you've done something wrong, but simply because of the color of your skin. We need to put ourselves there and we need to say that's just not acceptable. And I think you're right. We have to put our faith in the children 
and work more to make sure that our public policies um, follow um, follow follow up. We we need to be active in this, and I feel like this was kind of a one way conversation. And and I want you to know that at least this person sitting out here listening is uh, is absorbing what you're saying, and yeah. and I. I wish it were different and I'll work to make it different. I wanted to add to that. Uh, in, in November, we have another guest speaker, but in December, we'll have the whole session uh, to have a conversation just among ourselves. And so if you wanna think about some of the things that we have learned from the beginning until now, maybe keep that in mind so you can, you can raise the questions that may, have, may have come up at that point. So the Perfect. December meeting will be just a conversation among us. Okay. Yeah. Good.